Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sustainable Finance and Investment Seminar. Uh, as some of you know, my name is Song Yang, and I'm your host for this seminar series. Uh, I'm a faculty member at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, KAIST, and also an affiliated fellow at the Stanford Center for Sustainable Development and Global Competitiveness. Uh, this monthly seminar uh, series is a collaborative effort between Stanford Sustainable Finance Initiative, SFI, uh, and KAIST, uh, green, uh, graduate school on green growth and sustainability. So today we have two special guests who are also among my favorite collaborators, uh, Kaku Morio and Isabella Yoon. Uh, Kaku is a researcher at Hitachi America, and he is uh, currently a visiting scholar at Stanford Science and Applications Program. Uh, his research focuses on natural language processing and applied machine learning. Isabella here is a teaching fellow at the Department of Accounting and Finance at the University of Otago, where she also earned her PhD. So her research centers on the derivative markets. So Kaku and Isabella will be sharing about the research project that we together have been working on uh, together uh, this year alongside Professor Chris Manning at the CS department here at Stanford. Um, who is also the Associate Director of Human-Centered AI. Uh, this research focuses on the corporate uh, sustainability communication. And I especially like this project because it develops its own NLP method to analyze the communication patterns and use them to understand uh, corporate sustainability strategy. So it's very interdisciplinary and then um, it's gonna be very relevant topic to um to our audience. So without further ado, please join me uh, welcoming Kaku and Isabella. Thank you for joining today. Uh, thank you, Soyon, for your kind introduction. Um, I'm Kaku Mario. I'm from uh, uh, Stats America and a uh, business school at Stanford University. And uh, again, uh, yeah, this is a joint work with a. Uh, Isabella Yun, Soyeon In, and Christopher D. Manning. I'd like to um, express my gratitude to great collaborators. And um, for your information, uh, we have some publications related to this uh, presentation. Uh, for example, we have uh, published a paper titled Report Pass, uh, which is about a unified NLP tool for extracting document structure and semantics of corporate sustainable reporting. And if you are interested in, please uh, also refer to our paper. Uh, let me start with the current state of the research landscape related to corporate sustainability. So, as you may know, there is certain amount of, uh, um, you know, attention towards the global net zero transition. For example, uh, major companies like Apple pledged a uh, net zero target by 2050. And these sort of uh, pledges are driven by um, social pressures from people uh, like investors or consumers who are aware of uh, climate change or global warming crises. And at the same time, there is a certain amount of attention for financial value on sustainability. I mean, um, both public and private sectors provide capital um, for, for farms that align with uh, specific climate policy or climate prejudice actions and any sort of that. And also there are initiatives and um, kinds of nonprofit organizations um, that um, care about and verify the purchase actions and, and commitments of the farms. For example, uh, there are initiatives like Climate Action 100 Plus and uh, nonprofit organization like CDP, uh, a famous one um, that um, you know, provide a methodology to um, for further corporate disclosure about sustainability. Um, and all of these kinds of uh, sustainability related disclosures are now um, published in the form of corporate reports. For example, uh, 10K is an annual report and 
recently, uh, uh, many of firms provide uh, corporate sustainability or social responsibility report um, as a tool to communicate um, the sustainable action or climate commitment. And actually, there is a certain amount of data related to sustainability. And we um, now, uh, in this um, figure, we split the data into two types, um, self-disclosed and third-party evaluated. And we also split it into uh, mandatory or voluntary. Um, for example, for voluntary and self-disclosed one, uh, we have uh, data like um, corporate disclosure uh, by CDP, TCFD, and any sort of, you know, um, self-disclosed things. And also there are uh, um, third body evaluated uh, voluntary or mandatory uh, reporting like um, ESG ratings from S&P Global or MSCI. And yes, we have a certain amount of data related to corporate sustainability, but at the same time, there are outstanding concerns here. For example, the first one is uh, inconsistency, um, and it stems from the differences in the methodologies, data sources, and waiting schemes used by different agencies. Um, think about uh, ESG ratings. Even though we are referring to the same word ESG rating, um, different entities provide different ESG ratings by you know, using different methodology, different rating schemes, and different, you know, kinds of biases. And that's a problem of inconsistency, for example. And there's another concern of reliability. And it stems from the stakeholder pressure and external audit in shaping the quality of environmental disclosures. So, Researchers recently see this sort of inconsistency and reality um, issues by viewing um, the data from different elements. In this slide, we, uh, you know, classify, uh, we provide three types of uh, elements related to corporate sustainability um, data. The first one is environmental communication, we call EC. So EC is uh, any sort of environmental communication from the farms. For example, uh, annual reports are one of uh, important too. And also a corporate responsibility report or sustainability reports uh, also are categorized in, in EC. And the second element is EP, stands for uh, environmental performance. And EP refers to um, factual uh, performance of environment, like you know, corporate emission of CO two, um, including scope one to three. And finally, uh, we also uh, provide the environmental score ES, and this is a kind of uh, third body evaluated score, uh, ESG ratings, and. Researchers, uh, you know, recently trying to see different, you know, data uh, from these, uh, you know, elements. For example, Bingra 2024 provided a so-called cheap talk index, where the work provided a easy variable by computing a portion of uh, mentions that are related to climate commitment and specific for uh, some sort of you know, action. And compare the EC variable with uh, actual GG emission of farms. And Bingra's work found uh, some you know, inconsistency uh, between EC and EP. And also, there is a, uh, there's a work uh, that compares ES and EC. Szymanski 2024 um, tried to provide a model that can explain um, ESG ratings, uh, so ES, by, um, by, by EC variables, then their work provided um, sort of uh, NLP-based uh, methodology to capture EC 
by investigating the amount of ESG-related topics included in corporate annual uh, no, no, corporate sustainability reports. And there's also a literature that compares ES and EP uh, by uh, Chalaji 2009 and in 2021. And so in summary, there's a certain amount of uh, researches um, related to um, EC, EP, and ES, but the, um, there is um, research um, problem um, where you know no no none of them provided comprehensive analysis for these three elements. And that's why in our presentation, we would like to um, focus on the holistic and comprehensive analysis between all of the EC, ES, and EP dynamics. And we would like to see um, you know, how they relate to and how they affect um, each other. So uh, we have conducted some preliminary analysis and preliminary, you know, process building, and we investigated uh, existing frameworks, existing methods, and existing results. And we came up with some uh, major hypotheses um, as shown here. Um, so we at first start with comparing EC and EP. So um, the hypothesis one is that firms with low environmental performance are more likely to be environmentally vocal. So, um, so I mean, in this work, we would like to focus on EC, especially from the view of environmental, you know, vocalness of the farm, then compare it with EP. And hypothesis two is a kind of variant of hypothesis one, um, that is, uh, since the announcement of Paris Agreement, corporate communication patterns have changed due to increased public awareness. And this is, uh, you know, you know. Here, we want to see the effect of a specific climate policy agreement for the relationship between EC and EP. And finally, we'd like to see the comprehensive dynamics between ES, EP, and EC. And in the hypothesis uh, is that uh, environmental communication as a strategic tool to mitigate negative perception can either augment or mitigate the impact of environmental performance on corporate environmental evaluation. So uh, those were our hypotheses. And to verify them, we have uh, uh, constructed a data set um, by uh, using firms, um, including more than 1,500 observations from 293 publicly traded U.S. farms, uh, ranging um, from 2010 to 2021. And again, uh, we would like to focus on uh, the three elements, EP, ES, and EC, and these are key variables in our study. And I'd like to uh, explain uh, detail about, uh, I'd like to uh, explain it briefly here. So EP, we use uh, CO2 emissions total, changes in emission and emission intensity in our um, variable. And for ES, uh, we used environmental PR score and ESG score for our variable. And finally, EC, we have used uh, climate, climate commitment and climate risk, climate opportunity and reaction target variables. And the data sources uh, for EP and ES, uh, we used firm characteristic firm characteristics variables uh, from Thomson, Reuters, Acon, ESG. And for EC, we have uh, corrected corporate responsible reports and uh, you try uh, report pass two. Uh, I will describe it later. Uh, so um, before moving on to uh, the detail of the data and variables, I would like to um, um, clarify what EC matters? Because uh, some of you may question that, you know, what is EC and why EC matters? So I'd like to answer it uh, briefly in slide. So EC in general is about what companies are talking about the environment. And 
Um, many of EC stem from textual disclosures, such as responsive reports, annual reports, and even social media posts. So by investigating EC from, for example, responsive reports, we could understand communication patterns in corporate strategy towards achieving their environmental goals. So um, you think EC is super important here, right? And um, EC is also recently uh, attracting much attention in the analysis of these kinds of research because recent trend, uh, uh, recent technical advances of NLP made it possible to capture ECs. Some of you may uh, heard about, you know, large language model or previously, uh, you know, famous uh, BART models, right? And for example, Bingra uh, 2024 uses climate BART, uh, an NLP model to capture the GTOC index um, for corporate annual reports. And climate BART is uh, sort of a general NLP model trained on large climate related text corpus. And these uh, kinds of uh, uh, advancement of language models uh, made it possible to, you know, focus more on the um, environmental communication um, in the corporate sustainability related disclosures. So that's the context. And uh, going back to our data source of EC, um, we decided to use responsibility reports for the EC source. Uh, this is because the corporate responsibility reports include voluntary environmental communication information. And our assumption is that compared to mandatory reporting like 10K or new reports, um, corporates tend to you know, exaggerate uh, their climate actions uh, in their uh, you know, corporate responsibility reports because they are not um, regulated structurally by law. And that's why we could understand the vocalness of firms in terms of the environment by uh, you know, seeing the corporate responsibility reports. And yeah, so that's, that's the context. And, but uh, at the same time, we acknowledge that there is a limitation. Um, for example, uh, we do not care about verifying the communication content. I mean, we do not care about the truthness of the corporate climate a corporate claim about climate. And also we do not care about the, you know, validity of the uh, specific, you know, actions or commitment. So that's a limitation. But anyhow, we'd like to see the vocalness of the uh, environmental communication. And this is the pipeline to get EC data from responsibility reports. Um, the right figure shows a conceptual sketch of the pipeline. It's, it's uh, somehow simple. So uh, we obtained the corporate responsibility reports from responsibilityreports.com for firms listed on New York Stock Exchange. Then given these input reports in the form of PDF files, we at first utilize report pass two. I, I, do, like, I will describe it later, but these two can extract label data for the corporate reports. Then we have used this label data to construct the EC variables. And I've just to detail more on the uh, uh, report pass two. So report pass two is a kinds of uh, tool for NLP researchers or uh, sustainable finance researchers to extra climate rated blocks with specific label. Here blocks means uh, the similar uh, one of uh, progress. So um, we would like to extract climate, climate rated paragraphs with specific label. And this can, uh, this too can adapt various different document analysis tool and NLP models like, you know, climate bird. And we can customize the report analysis by using this tool. And we uh, actually, uh, you know, applied uh, some NLP models to extract climate related paragraphs or climate committee related paragraphs and, and so on. And 
in that to this end uh, uh, that's why we uh, you know get the uh, label data here and based on this data we calculate the number of blocks related to a particular claim then used to compute the EC variables um, I would like to uh, describe the detail of the computation of EC in the next slide um, but uh, yeah and um actually uh, report plus two is a open source tool and it's free and it's open to anyone so if you're interested in please try it out um you can access to the github project here um if you uh, cannot remember this one uh, please uh, contact me later i can tell you your, uh, that, that you know link um so going back to the NC computation. Um, we'd like to, uh, you know, detail how we obtain EC variable here. So concretely for a report of the file I in ERT, we at first get the number of blocks in a report. So we call the number block IT. Uh, again, block is a similar meaning to paragraph. So here we get the um, number of paragraphs in a report. And secondly, we get the number of blocks labeled as environmental communication in a report. We call this uh, number EC block IT. And then EC variables can be derived as follows. And I mean, uh, the number EC block IT is divided by uh, number block. And this uh, EC variable can capture the portion of a uh, vocalness uh, the portion of environmental communication included in the report, and this reflects the vocalness of the environmental communication by a farm for ERT. And we also adopt several existing NLP models provided by Bingra's work and Simansky's works. And specifically, we extract the following crime blocks. The first one is climate. This is about the number of climate-related blocks. And the second one is climate sentiment opportunity. It's about the uh, number of opportunity mentioned related to climate change. And climate sentiment risk is that uh, variant of the opportunity one, uh, especially for the risk. And climate commitment is about the number of climate commitment and action mentions. And reduction target is about the number of net zero or reduction target mentions. So uh, in the result and discussion section, we will uh, provide these five different issue variables in the table and discuss uh, the result later. And I would like to also um, clarify what's the unique on our report pass generated data. So yes, uh, we are using um, existing variables of Bingrad's work and Szymanski's work, but we are not using the same one. So, uh, I mean, we modify the variables to define the environmental vocalness. And specifically, we do not focus on the chip doc index. Uh, rather, we focus only on the vocalness of EC. And uh, that's the basic difference. And also, uh, previous work mainly utilized uh, mandatory reporting, uh, I mean, annual reports, but our work focuses on the voluntary reporting by corporate responsibility reports. And we also compare multiple EC variables in our results. And there are other many, you know, uh, technical differences uh, uh, within report plus, but I'd like to omit detail here because uh, yeah, most of you are not in the expert of NLP. Um, yes, so um, from here, we'd like to talk about the statistics of the data. So I'd like to pass the presentation to Isabella. All right, so thank you so much, Kaku, for um, providing all the detail about what data that we are actually using in our analysis. So we are getting into the results section. We're first going to take a look at, okay, if we were to compute the, um, the vocalness of um, what sort of variable are we looking at in our, so those, um, our emission performance variable, I mean, environmental performance variable, as well as the environmental evaluation variable. 
So for panel A is essentially um, those vocalness variable that we are looking at. So there are five labels that we extracted from using the report pause as our tool. And the panel A essentially just shows the average proportion of claims by industry. So we used the GICS uh, industry code to um, categorize those industry into these buckets. So overall, the essentially this trend in the table in panel A just shows that as we can see, like energy and the utility and as a material company, um, those sectors exhibit the highest proportion of communication about climate related issue. So um, this is, I think, as expected as these sectors are probably directly impacted by environmental regulation and have a high exposure to climate change risk. And when we look at the um, industrial, which is the sector core 20 and the consumer discretionary 25, it actually shows relatively lower level of climate communication. And then in the bottom of the panel A, it shows the average proportion across all sectors. So we can see that firms on average, they seem to focus more uh, talk broadly about the climate claim rather than the climate um, opportunity or risk. So climate and climate commitments are the ones that those firms that we analyze in our sample talks the most. And the second table is just give us the summary of um, our emission variable by industry. So we have a three column here. So these are the three um, dependent variable that we use in our analysis as our environmental performance. The first one is just the, um, the log of total emission. And the second column is just a change in emission level so that essentially um, you can interpret that as a growth in emissions. And the third column is the emission intensity. So um, when we look at the second table, similar to the first table, the energy sector and utility sector exhibit uh, very high emissions in the intensity. But some sectors like uh, consumer staples and healthcare are relatively doing better in terms of emission management, I'd say. And the third table that we have here is the uh, environmental evaluation variable, which is what we use as a third party evaluation of how companies are being environmentally friendly or not. Um, and these, this uh, final variable in panel B on the right hand side is going to be used as in our third hypothesis when we are trying to look at the relationship between the environmental communication on the company's environmental performance. And uh, these sort of patterns are also illustrated in the next few slides. We can talk about it a bit more, but I think probably worthwhile to talk more about our analysis. So I'll just skip through these graph. And this leads us to our first uh, hypothesis again. So um, in the previous paper, Ingram and Frazier, 1980, they essentially highlight the potential biases in voluntary disclosure not the mandatory. So they essentially note that the firms with poorer emission performance, environmental performance, might report more extensively and the possibly to mitigate the negative perception from like other stakeholders in, except in cases of litigation and disclosure. And I think what they're saying in their paper is sort of support the notion that firms may um, strategically manage the amount and the type of information that they disclose in their report. Um, it's aligning very well with the recent study by Leon and Maxwell 2011. So concept of disclosure as a strategy, like a game-like behavior. And that led to our first hypothesis that you can see in this page, which is firms with low environmental performance are more likely to be environmentally vocal. So on the left-hand side, what you see here is our um, environmental performance variable. So it's a panel regression setting, all contemporaneous analysis. So EP denotes a set of EP variable as we described earlier, total emission, growth in emission, emission intensity for each from I at time T. So we are looking at yearly sample. Then uh, environmental communication denotes a set of claim variable that we talk about climate, climate commitment, climate opportunity and risk and the reduction target. 
And as Kaku already uh, discussed, there is a fun characteristic variable that we use as a control variable. And we also used a fix, so ear fix and inverse fix effect in this analysis for our hypothesis one. So we, we believe that this model is nice and simple and probably some other study have done similar analysis. But what's important here is that our EC variable is unique and it's generated by the tool that Kaku discussed, report pass. And we it'll be really valuable for us to use this model to actually look at the impact of voluntary climate related disclosure on firms actual environmental performance. So we then so next page we have a result of a hypothesis one. So as we sort of marked it in the red boxes, you can see the impact or the relationship between the environmental communication in our EP variable. So we see that the positive coefficient between the climate and the emission level and also climate commitment in the emission level and also climate opportunity emission level in columns one, two, and four respectively. So this positive coefficient of this beta one, we're referring to the model that we um, discussed in the previous slide, is essentially suggests that firms with the stronger or more active communication related to climate or climate commitment or the opportunity tend to have a lower environmental performance. Why is it lower? I mean, EP is not actually uh, what, uh, it's the total emission, right? So if they have a positive relationship that essentially translate to the firm with the active communication about these label tend to have a lower environmental performance. So for example, high emission level, high emission growth or high, high emission intensity. I've, we believe that this finding indicate that the firms uh, that are publicly commit or commit to addressing the climate change or report on the environmental issue may not yet be translating this commitment into the tangible reduction in the emissions or improvement in their environmental practices. So in other words, um, the climate claims may not be backed by uh, corresponding action. So that actually leads to the higher or growth in emission despite their public commitment. All right, so moving to our second hypothesis and the Main reason why we wanted to test this H2, hypothesis two, is the previous literature, um, they examined the role of external pressure on firms' communication strategy. So for example, Delma in Burbano 2011, and also some other paper as well. In the recent study, they also look at uh, the specific events like Paris Agreement in their model to test um, whether any differential effect can be identified. So we investigate uh, whether the public pressure, in this case, the Paris Agreement on firms' emission performance is associated with the firm's environmental communication. So in hypothesis two, we um, argue that since the announcement of the Paris Agreement, corporate communication pattern have changed due to increased public awareness. So EP is as we described in the previous slide, that's uh, our environmental performance variable. So we use three variable. And the treated EC is uh, the treatment group. So based on the EC communication. So say for example, if we're looking at the climate, so it's a dummy variable equal to one if the firm is in the top tercile of the climate related communication and zero otherwise, and we do this for uh, our five category of different claim. And the Paris is an indicator variable equal to one if the year is greater than 2015 and zero otherwise. So again, in here, what we want to try to see is the differential effect that is coming from the Paris agreement. So our main coefficient of interest is beta three, and this will capture the interaction effect between the treatment group and then Paris agreement as our external shock and the impact of EC on EP after Paris agreement. So that is essentially capturing the um, differential effect. 
If we take a look at the result of the second hypothesis on the next page, again, I highlighted here in the red boxes. So say, for example, for column one, so what does result indicate, for, uh, especially for the treated climate times periods? So the beta coefficient positive for that um, variable, the interaction term, is essentially suggests that the uh, very strong effect of climate communication on emission so um, spe specifically, firms that are in a top tercile for the climate communication uh, and the operated in, in the post Paris period, so after 2015, saw so a greater reduction in emission than those in the same group before Paris Agreement. So this negative um, interaction terms essentially implies that after Paris Agreement, Funds that were already in the top tercile of communication, so for example, those that were more proactive in communicating their um, environmental goals, experienced um, experience greater reduction in emission compared to their counterparts, so who were not in the top tercile of that particular climate communication. Now, this essentially suggests that these firms were more likely to sort of align their action with the climate communication in response to the Paris Agreement. And as we already mentioned in our hypothesis, possibly due to the regulatory pressure or increased in expectation from investors and other stakeholders. And they not only communicated about climate change, but also feel pressure to actually reduce uh, their environmental footprint. And Moving on to the next hypothesis, which is linking this Isabella, environment. Yeah. Sorry to uh, interrupt. We have, a, I think, a clarification question to the hypothesis setup for two. Yep. So from the chat, why the outcome variable not environmental communication for H2? It's environmental performance. So we wanted to actually look at how the vocalness of firm is related to how much they're emitting. So I guess we can always, um, so what we wanted to see was, okay, whether the vocalness in voluntary report is related to uh, their environmental performance, not the other way around. I'm too sure whether I guess I was wondering. Um, yeah, that was my question because, like, your hypothesis uh -huh. is about how communication patterns changed after the Paris Accords. So I would mm -hmm. expect to see something like, "Oh, firms increased their climate-related blocks after Paris." Or something oh, like yes. That. Thank you for that. Well, actually, we have the subsample analysis that actually shows the increased relationship between the communication and the environmental performance. But that's not actually included here because we just wanted to see um, whether there's any effect coming from the Paris Agreement. But thank you for that, Elvis, right? Yeah, thanks. Yes. Thanks for your question. We do have those results in our full um, paper, Elvis, manuscript. Elvis, your question uh, was not on the first hypothesis. It was on, on H2, right? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so are there any other questions? Feel free to, you know, just ask. And if you have a better way for us to capture this policy impact, we'll be happy to hear about it. Because as I'm not too sure whether uh, Kaku mentioned it or not, but it's pretty early stage for uh, early stage analysis. So we're happy to hear any feedback that you may have. But My question is that, yeah. Uh, are you looking at, so there are two types of emissions that are reported. There is location-based and market-based. Which one did you use for your data? So scope one and two, we're probably looking at, can't remember on my top of my head, but we download this emission data from the Refinitiv. Do you know whether the Refinitiv uh, scope one and two in, in total emission data are market-based or? I don't know. I'm asking because I have prepared these right. in the past. So oh, right. there are two numbers, location-based and market-based. And market-based mm -hmm. basically means that you 
you can apply offsets. Um, and location based means that it is really your emissions, total emissions. Mm. So, um, so there, so there are two things to see: uh, are your total emissions increasing over time, and then are you doing enough to keep your market based emissions? Um, are you are you doing enough to lower your market based emissions? Which means you're investing in renewable or you're investing mm -hmm. in offsets or you're doing right, right. right. right? Uh, whereas mm -hmm. your absolute emission, which is your total emission, location mm -hmm. means can continue to rise, which is not mm -hmm. a positive sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that's I think actually, that's really great comments and the feedback. So we'll definitely check that. Sure. I think for our sample, what we observed uh, in terms of the emission level over time, if I remember correctly, it is quite similar over time. So from 2010 to 2021 not looking at the particular industry, but just overall time series, it, we sort of see so the similar level of the emission over time. If not I, substantially decreasing is that across over time. The, is, is that uh, the time series, is it across the industry or is it? Across is it, industry. Yeah, that's uh, that's the one that I can remember right now. Okay. And I'm happy to take this conversation offline. I have lots of questions, but all right, yeah, thanks. So great much. study, yes. and I'm I'm really uh, for someone who actually prepared these reports. I'm very very yeah. curious. Oh, we're we're all ears here. We'd love to yeah. hear more about that for sure. We'll definitely follow up with you. Uh, Isabella, if I may add one more, thank you for the comments uh, and then the question. Uh -huh. So for this one, I think it's about scope one, two, and three. Uh, in you know, like a, in the very beginning of our analysis phase, we actually okay. look at you know like uh, the scope one, two, or one to three total, and then scope one versus scope three, and so on. Uh, and then you know we were, uh, but then you know like uh, we, we kind of like ended up dropping uh, the scope three for for mm -hmm. this. Analysis is because uh, scope Relied 3 is very uh, inconsistent. And then also we know that although we are talking about carbon emission, absolute carbon emission, uh, however, the source of the carbon emission data is also like another source of the variation. Yeah, meaning that, you know, like whether this carbon data is coming from the SMP versus carbon data that is coming from the refinitive may uh, have different result. So um, that's why we ran the, the robustness for that. Um, but, you know, like uh, luckily in terms of scope one and two, where we ended up looking at is uh, fairly consistent uh, when we not consider the scope three uh, in terms of the trend. Yeah. Uh, we have one other question from the chat, but uh, that makes three. total sense not to have scope mm -hmm. three data because that can mm -hmm. skew. Uh, first of all, it's inconsistent. It's not, in most cases, not validated and um, and uh, in, in many cases, incomplete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That was the, that was the, like, uh, how we, we at the, at the very beginning, at the sink, you know, like, uh, which one we should stick with this <laughs> one. Um, yeah. yeah, Isabella, I will let you go finish the hypothesis. Okay. Three. Yeah. We just have one, yeah, one more, <laughs> one more table in the hypothesis. Okay, so thanks everyone for all your comment. Yeah, so let's go through the last hypothesis, which is to look at the um, so as an environmental communication as a strategic tool to mitigate the negative perceptions can either augment or mitigate the impact of environmental performance on corporate environmental evaluation. So in this model, on the left-hand side, what we have is our ES variable, which is the environmental pillar score uh, for company I and for year T, which we downloaded from uh, Refinitiv. And the EC variables are those five claim variables that we discussed, and EP is um, the emissions and the emission growth and also the emission intensity. And we use the same set of control variable. We have a fixed effect for time, 
year in the industry and after so what we are trying to do here or to want to focus is this is beta 3 because beta 3 essentially are going to tell us um, the interaction of the environmental communication and the performance on how they are or how those companies are being evaluated by the third party. So for the brevity of this presentation, so we include on result only with the total emission level. So overall, what we found for our beta three, which is the interaction term, is essentially suggests that when um, when both emission performance and an EC are high, uh, uh, there is a, uh, it's a negative effect of individual um, bearable may be mitigated. So it essentially means that uh, the effective communication about climate and climate commitment or opportunity could offset the negative perception of a high emission. So, in other words, we cannot reject our third hypothesis that EC as a strategy tool to mitigate the negative perception can either augment or mitigate the impact of environmental performance on the corporate environmental evaluation by third party. But when we look at the uh, marginal effect of the environmental communication on the uh, environmental evaluation, it essentially varies depending on the level of um, EP. So, for example, if the EP is really low, and, and for, uh, so that means when we have a very high emission level, communication alone cannot really affect the how firms are being evaluated by the third party without addressing the emission. And if we, for example, have a very, very high emission performance, meaning like very low emission, total emission, this can turn the marginal effect of the environmental communication to be positive. So um, in order for firms to actually have a positive effect of EC on ES, so firm must to have very good performance in terms of their uh, environmental um, practices, because otherwise this um, marginal effect cannot be positive. So even though we see the positive coefficient, this, um, the combined effect is not high enough to actually um, of, uh, mitigate or influence how firms are being evaluated by third party. So overall, this table essentially suggests that the communication can effectively mitigate the negative impact of high emission by possibly signaling proactive environmental strategy. But again, so if we talk about that marginal effect, the company should, the company must have a high um, or good environmental performance in order for them to actually flip this effect that is coming from the communication. Uh, does this mean that like the communication is kind of useless? Like if it only depends on like how the company actually performs, like what they get rated in the end? Or are you finding that there is some influence of communication? So climate communication alone actually have a negative impact. So we're not saying it's useless. What is What this is actually capturing is all of this is based on the voluntary report, right? So if you think about how third parties are evaluating about companies' environmental performance, if this information is not legit and not reliable, this should not have any effect whatsoever to how the firm is being evaluated, right? But what we are seeing here is that just by communicating in high by uh, by having high emission, that can actually affect the the how firms are being evaluated in terms of their environmental practices. I need to think about it a little bit more. I just don't know where to look in the table for that result. Is your question yep. about second bullet communication about climate? Yes, may influence perceptions of high emissions. So basically, I think what it's saying is that for companies that have high emissions, if they communicate more about their climate, 
uh, commitments, their opportunities, then that perception of high emissions uh, can be uh, brought down. But then the environmental score goes down, which means like they performed worse, right? Well, yes. environmental score, uh, no, there is no environmental score here. It's environmental performance, not ESPP. That's ES. So dependent variable is ES. We're looking at. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I understand um, your question, uh, LD. LDs, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So main quickly move on to our main finding. So regarding the first hypothesis, what we found is that the firms tend to be more vocal when their environmental performance is weaker. And the second finding is that um, the firms in top tertiary for environmental communication experience a notable reduction in their environmental performance following the introduction of the Paris Agreement. And the third finding is that active environmental communication can influence a firm's environmental pillar score. However, this effect appears to be marginal, so indicating that the EC alone may not be sufficient to materially improve ES evaluation or influence the evaluation by the third party. Yeah, but but I guess transparency is the is the foundational element. That's how companies look at it. That. Mm -hmm. Uh, first, they become transparent because if you're closed and, and opaque, then that's worse. So you become transparent, and so you're, which means that you're making effort to collect the data, you're making effort to share that. Mm -hmm. And uh, although your score by third party, uh, ES doesn't improve, but uh, it is still encouraged. And this, I mean, that's the way the, the sustainability team in the companies are thinking about it. We, we have two papers on this. One is report for services on the methodology that is open sourced, as Kaka already told. And then the working paper, which is the this analysis part, will be soon updated. But uh, I, I'm going to share this through uh, SFI website. Mm -hmm. But going back to, because this is a very interesting discuss uh, that Isabella, Kaku, Chris, and I had. Uh, about this, you know, like uh, the findings from the hypothesis three. So, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, Isabella already mentioned enough, but uh, I think from my own perspective, it was very interesting because it, so, you know, like if we are to look at uh, the environmental performance and environmental evaluation as like a by, you know, like a, as a binary relationship, then, you know, like, uh, yes, of course, you know, like a, when you're not doing good in terms of the environmental performance, then you know you are not gonna get the good score, right? So that's the that's the fundamental relations, and then we were able to find it empirically. But what was interesting is that you know, like, okay, by having the environmental communication on top of it, there is you know like a slight chance um, that the environmental communication can moderate this relationship. However, we were not able to find that this environmental communication we flipped the, the fundamental nature of the relationship, which is, you know, like it won't change this negative relationship to the positive. Um, no. I mean, uh, that was very interesting. So like, yes, uh, however, I mean, there could be some point when <laughs> that, you know, like the, communicate, the company communicate about the environment very, very much. So that they can hit the threshold and then fund uh, like finally change the flip the relationship between um, the environmental performance and environmental evaluation. However, that is actually uh, that can be possible when the communication is totally free. You know, like uh, you are not thinking about any transaction cost to you know promote your environmental performance and so on. Then you may do that. Uh, but you know, like uh, from our empirical, like a uh, coefficient, the the degree of the coefficients is very low. So that was why we were thinking that um, it's it, it's very unlikely that you know, like a uh, communication as a single factor that will manipulate this this relationship from 
uh, negative to the uh, negative to the positive or the other way around. So that one was interesting findings that we had. Oh, Sorry, yeah, I... you go first. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> guys, uh, the, this is like a fun project. So, this is a part of our research project, but we are actually building a bigger community on what is called sustainable transition with AI. So, we call it as a stay. Um, so, we actually uh, made this happen this year for the first time, and then we went to the Itzkai conference, and then we did a full uh, full day workshop there. So, we got really great papers from all over the world. And then we actually selected a few and invited to the, to the workshop. And then we had this great gathering. Uh, we are actually doing it for 2025 also. Uh, so please stay tuned because we'll be coming back for the second time, which is greater. Thank you, Kaku and Isabella. And then I will share, uh, you will be able to find our um, contact details uh, from the university website. So please feel free to reach out for the further communication. And then also we'll be sharing our research outputs uh, through Stanford and through KAIST channels. Uh, unfortunately, but it's great that um, today's session is the last session of this, this quarter uh, seminar series. We will come back for uh, January. So I'll be, uh, and then, you know, we'll be doing the monthly seminar during the spring, uh, winter quarter as well. So that means starting from the January. Uh, the specific dates will be announced from um, SFI website. So please stay tuned for that one too. So thank you for joining today and then uh, happy holidays and then see you next year. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.